everyone, I'm Ari Witten, and welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. Today, I'm with Dr. Sam Byrne, who is a holistic optometrist and does some absolutely fascinating work in the realm of eye health and the interface between the eyes and the brain. So welcome, Dr. Sam Byrne. I am super excited to have this discussion with you. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Yeah. So you do a lot of unique stuff. You don't just focus on, you know, kind of typical optometry sort of stuff. There's, there's a lot of unique things that you're doing in your work. Um, and I would love if you could just talk a bit about your background and how you got into this, because you have a fascinating personal story, uh, and, and kind of do an overview of the work that you do. Well, my, uh, my initiation started when I was about eight years old. I had a pretty difficult childhood and I had a learning disability and my parents took me everywhere to try to figure it out. And we ended up in an eye doctor's office and I got a pair of nearsighted glasses. It didn't really touch my learning problem at all. Uh, and I was a memorizer. That's basically how I got through school, worked really hard. And my eyes kept getting progressively worse. And when I graduated optometry school, I met a holistic eye doctor, he was in his 70s, and I went through his program called vision therapy, which is a form of physical therapy to improve your eyes and vision. He diagnosed me with a condition called convergence insufficiency, which means that my two eyes weren't working together, and my left eye would wander out and I actually saw double vision. So going through his program, I re that and my reading and learning skyrocketed and the second thing that happened was that I completely dissolved my really strong nearsighted prescription so I was able to see 2020 and I'm you know 30 years later I'm still seeing 2020 at distance and near wow. so I was able to you know change my prescription and those two things uh, inspired me to open a practice in the Philadelphia area and it was a holistic practice but I had such difficulty getting patients. And so uh, what I did is I went to one of the local hospitals nearby and I offered my services in the traumatic brain injury clinic. These are patients with double vision, memory problems, vestibular issues. And I applied this physical therapy to the eyes and it was an incredible success. And so I started to get contracts at other hospitals. And then I worked with the special needs uh, population. So I worked with kids with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome. And that's how I built my practice in, in the Philadelphia area. And that just started me on the, on the road of helping people from a more holistic perspective. Yeah, and, and this is fascinating. I think there's a big distinction here, which is that you're doing a lot of stuff that is really kind of outside of typical optometry stuff. Um, I, I think most optometrists just sort of focus very much on the eyes and not so much on at least this is my understanding, not so much on the interface between the eyes and the brain. Is that fairly accurate to say? Well, the science says that in fetal development in the first trimester, the eyes actually grow out from the brain. So every tissue of the eye is really brain tissue. So that brings us into something called neurogenesis, which means that you can regenerate the eyes and um, my approach actually helps people do things like reverse cataracts, reverse macular degeneration, reverse glaucoma, improve refractive errors uh, through natural methods. So I'm not using pharmaceuticals and uh, surgery, which actually takes you away, further away from your healing capability. And um, you know, over the years, I've had thousands of successes of people who have had these diagnoses. And uh, you know, it's very scary when you go to the eye doctor and they give you this diagnosis and they basically say, well, we'll watch it or you're gonna go blind and nothing will work. Uh, so you know, I'm there to say, well, actually, there's a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of connections. The eyes actually reflect if there's problems, chronic disease in the body, inflammation and stress, and you know, we can get into those things. But yeah, you can improve your vision at any age. And uh, that's my mission. Beautiful. So I, I want to dig in into that some more. Um, and, and let me, I guess, back up just a minute and talk about some of the most typical eye conditions like macular degeneration, glaucoma. Um, what's another one? Big one. A big one is cataracts. So 
what maybe for people who are unfamiliar with those things, could you explain a little bit about what each of those conditions are? And, um, and, and also if I'm neglecting to mention another condition, that's, uh, that's, that's also important, you know, please mention that. Okay. I would probably put dry eye syndrome in there just because of the digital device use. But what happens with our eyes is we get into these repetitive movements. It's a redundancy or a stasis. And this actually shuts down the energy flow in our retina. You know, the retina has one of the highest metabolic needs of the body and the macula has the highest metabolic need of the retina. Mm -hmm. So I would say it this way, the mitochondria shut down, they're not producing ATP and it, the, the, the visual system and the eye tissue are in a starvation pattern. So what I actually do in my eye therapy is I take people really far from their status quo and I challenge their vision. And in challenging their vision, it creates more energy flow, it creates a neurogenesis, and this is a way they're able to improve their vision pretty immediately. And I can give more specific examples, but that's a core philosophy for me, is to take people out of their familiar zone with how they see, and immediately it creates more energy on, in the retinal cells. That's, that's beautiful. And, and uh, you know, as we were talking about a bit before the, the podcast, you're speaking my language now because one of my favorite topics that I've talked a few times about on this podcast is, is hormesis, this kind of this idea of temporary metabolic stress, temporary challenges, and how those stimulate the system to make adaptations that ultimately confer uh, resilience or better health or better function. You know, right on. Uh, so, like, for example, you know, one of the things I do in my eye therapy is I put people into blurry vision because blur for most people is I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get injured. I'm scared. But actually, when you go into your blur and I have reverse glasses that I actually give people and they have to walk and move and balance when they take those blurry glasses off, their eyesight is crystal clear. Wow. I also use prism glasses that actually shift people into different parts of their peripheral vision that they're blind about. They don't, they're not accessing peripheral vision. That scares the heck out of them. But mm -hmm. it actually what it does is it creates more mitochondria production, ATP. And when they take them off, their eyes actually reset back to uh, a higher functioning state. Mm -hmm. Eye patch is another disruptor. So when you start using an eye patch, uh, this actually disrupts your habitual way of focusing. It's another way, as you say, uh, creates more energy flow in the eyes and the brain. It's, it's so exciting to see these shifts immediately when you challenge a person's vision. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. So that was, that's more relevant to macular degeneration. Is that correct? Or, or is that kind of stuff also relevant to cataracts? How does that, the stuff you just described, fit into you know, some of the, the big three conditions? So the three anatomical parts, the macula, the lens of the eye, and the cornea are what we call avascular tissues, which means there's no blood supply that runs through those areas. They rely on it indirectly. So it's a, it's a vulnerable area where the metabolism shuts down. And when the metabolism shuts down, it basically deadens the tissue. Cataracts is an opacity that forms over on the lens. It's dead tissue. The macula, the same thing. You're, you're not getting the proper carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin, to protect the eyes from macular damage. I would say with uh, cataracts, it's glutathione. That's mm -hmm. one of the main ingredients. And then in terms of the cornea, you know, with all the digital devices and also the sympathetic nervous system overworking and stress, uh, metabolic imbalances, this creates a drying out of the cornea and imbalance in the tears. So in all of these, it's the same thing. If you stress the vision differently, it actually creates more energy flow. And I use light therapy also. We can talk about how I use color and light to stress the system. I have a very inter interesting story about how to use light and color. Yeah, I definitely want to talk a lot about light with you. That's, that's one of my big areas. But um, first, what about glaucoma? Does, does that fit into this picture as well? So in terms of glaucoma, that's based on a circulation problem in the drainage canals in the eyes. And um, basically what happens is the optic nerve shuts down its flow and it creates visual field loss. 
I call it the silent thief. Glaucoma is actually a circulation problem in the canals of the eyes. So when you use eye drops, that actually doesn't do very much. And the other thing is doing laser surgery, which actually creates a lot of scar tissue. So the idea is how can you increase the peripheral vision, the energy flow of the canals in the eyes? And again, there's so many different ways to do that. I would also say, add is that I really like using phytochemicals. I, I love food healing. Uh, and these are really important tenants that I, I believe are helpful in changing the way the eyes are functioning. Yeah. So let's let's dig more into the phytochemicals thing. That's another big area of passion of, of mine and that I'm excited to talk to you about. Um, you mentioned briefly lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, uh, so what, what, are, what are some of the other big protective uh, eye nutrients and where do people get these foods? Well, you know, I'm a big believer in getting our foods from plant-based sources. And, you know, the things we throw out, like the seeds and the rind and the skin, those are the things I'm putting in my vitamins. And the phyto phytochemicals have incredible antioxidants that we can absorb in the body. And so, like, for example, I put my avocado seed in my Vitamix. There's a lot of cardiovascular improvement when you use something like that. So I'm looking for the rainbow diet. I'm looking for the colorful vegetables, gluten, uh, glutathione. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important is MSM. And I actually have MSM eye drops that I use for dry eyes. This is a sulfur-based eye drop. Glutathione needs sulfur. And so it actually enhances the penetration of anything that you're putting in your body by using these MSM eye drops. So, you know, it's plant-based, it's, um, you know, carotenoids, bioflavonoids. I much rather go for food healing. You know, I am shocked and appalled when I go even into Whole Foods, all the processed food that's there. And I really try to counsel my patients, eat better food. It's in the foods. Mm. So is there a few specific foods that you found are particularly, uh, especially beneficial? Well, I'll go through my short list, uh, you know, beets, orange bell peppers, uh, asparagus, avocados. I like cordyceps mushrooms. Um, you know, so those are, are a few of the, the kale, the spinach, the Brussels sprouts. Uh, so again, the green leafy vegetables, anything that's alive, that's colorful, can really help our eyes and our brain and our body. So Beautiful. Have you, have you uh, found any research on astaxanthin as it pertains to eye health? Uh, so astaxanthin is one of my powerhouses. So if you eat wild caught salmon, it's got that color in it. That's astaxanthin. Yeah, it's a superfood. It's, it's one of my go-tos for macular health, for reversing cataracts. Yeah, I love astaxanthin. Absolutely. Cool. Um, now, what about antioxidant supplements? Um, how do you feel about, you know, people taking high doses of uh, vitamin C, E, A, stuff like that in, in supplement form as opposed to getting it from food? I think it's a challenge point because, you know, in my practice, I'll have people come in and they'll be bringing in shopping bags full of vitamins and minerals. And I do kinesiology and, you know, I'm measuring energy compatibility and I really try to move people away from all of these antioxidants. You know, it actually stresses the liver more. And in Chinese medicine, the liver rules the eyes. And I have people like with floaters. This is another condition. So floaters is basically the jelly-like part of the eye begins to shrink. Uh, and it pulls away from the retina. And this is a place where the gel actually becomes solidified that creates these sparkles and flecks that come into the floater area. And people that take these really high potency antioxidants, a lot of times the floaters get worse. Mm -hmm. And so again, the idea is can we move them more to live foods, plant-based, uh, smoothies, you know, just, you know what I'm talking about. So I, I, I'm mixed about it. And, you know, if you look at the ARID study, this was a study, age-related macular degeneration, National Eye Institute did this study in 2001. They're saying take C, E, you know, beta carotene, and it reduces your risk of macular degeneration by 25%. So, you know, it's, it's confusing out there for people because they're like, oh, I'll just go take 
this uh, Aki Health vitamin, and it's got fillers in it and you know other toxicities. So if you can eat live food, that's what I would. That's my number one go-to. Yeah, yeah, and one more point I'll add on that the antioxidant things is that there, I think there's some there's definitely some positive research for certain specific conditions, but it needs to be balanced with the I think the full body of evidence on you know how do those same supplements impact other conditions? How does it impact overall longevity? And there's there's uh, quite a bit of research showing that it does not enhance longevity and may actually shorten lifespan and that it may actually increase risk of certain types of cancers and things like that. So uh, my personal opinion is you have to, has to be a little bit, you, you just have to weigh the overall pros and cons. Maybe a certain supplement is found to benefit this condition, but make this other condition worse. So there's a research study that actually a Facebook video I did and what it showed was that people that eat 16 to 20 different varieties of food had a 42% uh, lower risk of dying sooner. You know, it's like more longevity. People mm -hmm. that zero to six different types of food had much lower longevity. Mm -hmm. So I'm really pushing a wide variety of food. And yeah. yes, there are certain supplements that you can, you know, add a little bit, but you know what? You got to get it through the foods. You, you can't just take pills. It's not going to work. One hundred percent. Yeah, I'm, and I'm glad that you're you're saying that because that's very much aligned with with what I what I preach to people. Mm -hmm. So, what? So one thing I want to go back to that uh, you briefly touched on before that I think is really really important is um, neurogenesis. This idea of of being able to support the uh, the growth, the creation of, of brain neurons. So why is that so important? And what's the relationship of that to eye health? Well, uh, as I said earlier, that the, the eyes originate from brain tissue. So every tissue of the eye is brain. But the new research out there says that like it, there are different ways that you can um, regenerate the retina. They're called retinal ganglion cells. So they're doing stem cell therapy they're regenerating the RGC, the retinal ganglion cells. Certainly, actually, animals like zebrafish are already doing that, so you're regenerating the retina. And then there's the BDNF, uh, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And studies with the brain say that when you increase BDNF, you actually grow the hippocampus of the brain. There was a study that came out about the optic nerve where they crushed the optic nerve, and they started giving BDNF, and within a week, the optic nerve increased by 17%. And in two weeks, it increased by 50%. So this BDNF is getting a lot of play. Well, what can you do to increase BDNF? Uh, aerobic exercise every day, a better sleep, uh, make sure you're getting enough trace minerals, magnesium, and zinc, um, you know, getting more sunlight every day. So there's all these different basic things that you can do to increase BDNF. And you can, reduce, you can regenerate the eyes. And this is where people, they come to see me. I get so many emails from people. I was diagnosed with this condition. I'm going to go blind. There's nothing to do. And I say, wait a minute. There are all these different things you can do to regenerate your eyes. And they do that within a couple months. They have their eyesight back. Mm -hmm. And they disproved the doctor that says, oh, you're just going to go blind. Mm -hmm. And I think eye doctors were so limited in our indoctrination. And it's controversial. Hey, I'm the first one to tell you that. But I've had 30 years of clinical research. I've done other research. My patients are getting better without using drugs and surgery. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. So, folks, let's get let's get on the let's get on the track. It's working. Yeah, and and this makes sense. For, I mean, from the perspective of looking at things like cataracts or macular degeneration as this. Um, I mean, uh, it's more complex than this, but uh, you you can look at it from the perspective of a deficiency in in mitochondrial energy production in those areas uh, and uh, I, I guess a deficiency of, of resilience maybe from lack of uh, protective phytochemicals, lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, things like that, that um, make those tissues more susceptible to damage, more fragile and more likely to accumulate um, damaged cells and, and basically lead to that kind of progressive degeneration. And Logically, we also know that 
Well, if you start using those protective phytochemicals, if you start using strategies that um, support energy production, mitochondrial health, well, maybe you can stop progression. Maybe you can even reverse the, the condition. Yeah, so I would add one more piece to that, and that is how you use your eyes, mm -hmm. how you bring your eyes to the task that you're doing. And again, what we're doing with our eyes with just digital device, I read a statistic, 4 billion people are on digital devices. We're in a visual confinement situation. When you make the same repetitive movement over and over again, it's going to shut down the mitochondria. And I take a look at where a person's visual function is. Like, for example, people that are using progressive bifocals, basically you're focusing through a tiny hole when you're using the computer. Do you know how much stress that puts on your macula? That's why people are developing macular degeneration because they're focusing through a hole that their doctor prescribes these progressive invisible bifocals. What you need to do is you need to open your vision up to peripheral vision that's 99% of the retinal real estate that's not being used. Or if you're using a prescription that's based on distance and you're using it for the computer or reading, that's going to trash your eyes. That's going to bring your eyes into real deterioration. So by doing the exercises and stressing the eyes to open up and the phytochemicals that you're talking about, now you have the formula. I think you need both of them. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, then people can regenerate and create new pathways. If nothing else, it gives them the mindset that, oh, there's another way to work with it. That's not even mentioned in eye care's office, eye care offices. It's one thing, you're gonna go blind, that's it. Nutrition doesn't help, nothing is gonna work except pharmaceuticals and surgery. And the more surgeries you do, the more it opens up to secondary conditions like cataracts, macular degeneration, and so on. And one more piece, if I can just say it, from the digital devices, the damaging blue light, it suppresses our melatonin. It also can cause macular damage. So there you go. That's another protective mechanism. Blue, light, blue blocking lenses are really important for people. They don't yeah. know that. Yeah, so, yes. And um, thank you for bringing that up. I, I definitely want to dig into the light stuff. But as, as you were speaking, something just kind of popped into my head. It's, it's almost like the eyes are like a microcosm of kind of the bigger picture of our entire body. It's like we, we obviously have to put in good food, good nutrition to our bodies. If you don't, then you start to get various metabolic diseases. You accumulate body fat, insulin resistance, um, you know, various other, all, all kinds of diseases that relate to, to poor nutrition. Um, you got to take your, your body to the gym and do some exercise, move your muscles and you need to like not sit down all day and only kind of be in one particular repetitive movement pattern. Otherwise you start to get back pain and neck pain and things like that. And it's, it's almost like all of those same things are occurring in this microcosm of the eyes. Like you, you're, you're saying you obviously you have to put in the right nutri nutrition to the eyes. You have to give them the right nutrients to function well. You got to take them to the gym, meaning you have to, do certain exercises with your eyes to stimulate them in the right way. And you have to not be what I would say is the equivalent of being sedentary and sitting in a chair all day, which is like what you're talking about, kind of looking at a screen all the time. Your eyes are in this very limited sort of movement pattern. And I mean, that's anyway, does that resonate with you? That's kind of how I'm seeing things. Yeah, that's how it is. And the thing is, our eyes are so unconscious. We don't, we're not even aware of, that there's sensation in here. And, um, you know, when you go to the eye doctor and you're sitting in a dark room and the doctor's flipping lenses, which is clear, one or two, and let's say you're having a bad day and you choose number two and you get the lens and you put it on and you go, man, this is making me so dizzy. I'm nauseous. And the doctor says, hey, don't worry, you'll get used to it. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't want to get used to funneling my light through this filter that you're giving me, making me nauseous. I'll say one more thing. When you look into the retina, you're actually looking at the brain. You're looking at the systemic health. You can pick up things like diabetes, hypertension, even Alzheimer's now. There's a retinal scan that you could do to pick up that, uh, that Alzheimer's, the fatty deposits. So the eyes are kind of ahead of what's going on systemically and metabolically. It's a holographic window that you can look into to see this is what's going on systemically and metabolically 
And then you can treat it that way. It's not just an isolated system that's separate from the body. And that's what mm. I learned in school. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's like because the eyes are, are certain parts of the eyes are avascular tissues and more susceptible to damage. It's almost like the canary in the coal mine in a way, like it's the first place to start to get damaged. Right, exactly. It's, that's why when you do a retinal exam, you can pick up things. And when I do, when I see diabetic retinopathy, I say, okay, let's look at the insulin level. Let's look at what you're eating. Let's look at your obesity. Let's look at your, you know, your, another thing that's a buzzword now is nitric oxide. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard of that. So in terms of the eyes, when you start adding nitric oxide, it actually can reduce glaucoma. It can reduce inflammation in the eyes. It can reduce dry eye. So what are ways that you can get nitric oxide? Well, one way is getting UV light into the eyes. That's one way to increase. I'm sure uh -huh. you have ways to increase, increase nitric oxide. I'd love to hear that. But it's a really important for retinal health. And now we're in controversial territory because there's so many, I mean, this is something that comes up a lot for, for me and the people that I work with, the, the members of the Energy Blueprint program, is oftentimes I'll get questions from people who um, have cataracts or, or macular degeneration. And I, here I am, I'm telling people work on your circadian rhythm habits, morning light exposure being a, a very important one of those habits. Um, get outdoors, get natural light. And, um, and then it's, there's this conflict because a lot of these people are being told by their, their eye doctors, hey, avoid sun exposure, avoid UV light. Um, the, the bright light from the sun is, is harming your eyes. So uh, I always, you know, as with everything, I, I never, whenever somebody has any sort of medical condition, I always say, well, you know, always, you have to listen to your doctor's advice. I'm just here to present, you know, the science of how this particular habit pertains to health more broadly, but it's, I'm not prescribing it to treat a particular medical condition. Um, so what's, what's your take on this whole light thing? Should people be getting sunlight in their eyes in the morning? Uh, absolutely. We are heliotropic beings. We go towards the light and light is a food. And when it enters the eyes, it activates the photoreceptors and sends impulses back to the brain. That's how we see. There's actually about 25% of the light that enters the eyes goes through this pathway that activates the hypothalamus and the pineal and the pituitary. So we need light to see, and it's very important for our health. It balances our endocrine system, our nervous system. Now, in terms of uh, what you're saying about getting natural sunlight, we need ultraviolet light. Now, there have been studies out there that actually show that if you don't get enough UV light, now you've got to substitute it, or you've got to supplement with vitamin D. Isn't that interesting? That industry now is like, okay, no all UV, but now go buy vitamin D. Right. So it, it, it makes no sense to me. Yeah. And it's, uh, this, is a, this is a big pet peeve of mine as well, because so many people are now of the mindset that the benefits of sunlight can be reduced down to just vitamin D. And people don't realize that there's so many other mechanisms and pathways that the sun is affecting us beyond just how it affects vitamin D levels. And one of the things you just talked about is, is how, uh, you know, UV light directly in the eyes is uh, affecting nitric oxide levels. That's right. Cardiovascular health, the immune system. I and mean, we could go through the list of all the benefits. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, the mo moderation, I think, you know, I live in the desert southwest when I'm skiing up in Taos, which I did the other day. I was wearing my polarized sunglasses. I'm up at 12,000 feet, you know, hiking up there on my skis. And so that's cool. Or when I go to Hawaii and I lead dolphin swims and I'm on the ocean, I'll wear my, my sunglasses. But we need light to balance our mood, our pineal gland, our circadian rhythm. And you know, it's really interesting when I work with light therapy, I give people the colors that they don't like. So there's a color machine I use and the colors they don't like actually opens up their vision and opens up their health. So it's another way to challenge their, their eyes and their body by giving them the colors that they don't like. And it's yeah, really- tell me, tell me more about how, how does that work? Okay, so how that works is that, so if we go back to like the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks, Greeks, the Native Americans, the Mayans, they were using light therapy to heal the body. 
And in my field, there's actually a way that you can put different frequencies of colors into the retina that stimulate the photoreceptors that have become desensitized to light. In fact, certain colors will reflect toxicities, dental problems, toxicities, like if you're, if you're um, sensitive to green, for example, you may have certain toxicities in your body. It picks, up, picks that up. So when I give people different frequencies of colors, I call it the rainbow method. We look at red for two minutes and orange and yellow. And they might say, ah, I hate red. I don't want to look at red. I'll say, no, let's stay with it. Because what that's going to do is that's going to open up your retina and your vision. And that, that's what happens. A lot of times they will look at the colors they don't like. And afterwards, they can read 2020 on the eye chart. Wow. So it challenges them. And we're not just going to use the colors you like and you're comfortable with. We're going to give you the colors you don't like. And that creates more balance, more versatility, more neurogenesis. You know, it, it's it, it like the mitochondria get activated. So it's, it's very potent to use light therapy on the eyes. I mean, it changes a lots of things besides eyesight. Fascinating. And is, is there a way for people to use that in any way in, uh, on, by themselves or do they have to go to a clinic yeah. and, and see an expert to, to do that sort of thing? So there are ways that you can actually go out and get colored lenses. You know, there are different companies that sell it. Uh, I use these colored gels that I have made up. You know, they're just masks. And uh, there's a way that you actually look through each color for maybe you know 30 seconds and then you take a break and then you do palming so you're resting the eyes and then you go on to the next color orange and then yellow so you know it's very easily directed i even have people do it with an eye patch so they'll do it with each eye separately or they'll even do it with the reverse glasses so now they have blur and the color therapy so talk about challenging their current status quo and yeah. again at the very end it just creates more energy flow in the eyes duh it's going to work really well in restoring your vision mm -hmm. yeah. now yeah. i'm curious on this subject of 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 kind of like hormetic challenges to the system to to the eyes do you find that maybe people who are who are not eating a good diet and who are not putting good nutrients into their body or who are otherwise like just very sick and very ill if they're challenged using some of these these therapies do they get worse at all um do they react negatively to it sometimes if their bodies just don't have the resilience to handle it so a big population I work with is the chronic fatigue syndrome, Epstein-Barr. And with those people, of course, as you know, they're so fragile. Mm -hmm. So where I can take them initially, of course, is not going to be as far as, say, somebody like you or your clients who are robust and, you know, they're going for it and human potential. But I just have to meet them where they are. But I'm still pushing them. And the thing is, is that when you have chronic fatigue syndrome in terms of the eyes, you cannot correct for blurred vision because your vision is so all over the place. You've got dry eye syndrome, you've got, you can't focus. So I have to work with them in a different, you know, time zone, so to speak. But yes, it's the same ideas. I've got to push them into a bigger comfort zone. It's just not going to be the same way that I would push you. You yeah, just go a little smaller doses, a little slower in the progression. In the rest period in between. But as they get better at digesting the visual experiences, then I can ratchet it up. But yeah, I have to meet them where they are. And the same with kids. I work with a lot of autistic kids. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Actually, with those kids, I was working with a kid the other day. He couldn't jump rope. I mean, he took a shirt off. He's this wild kid, autistic. And I gave him these special glasses that ground him into his body. And the therapist watched him. He started jump rope. Like She's like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. So just by shifting him into his body more with these prisms, he was able to jump rope. So that's how immediate it is when you put per a person into a different part of their visual system. I mean, wow. It changes everything. Yeah. Amazing. When so, you think about so it, it's such a dominant way we relate to the world, and yet we take it for granted. All right, my mission is, hey, let's not forget this. There are all these other therapies out there in your work and other people. Nobody is talking about the eyes. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to dig a little more into light. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked about, you know, the fact that people shouldn't be just have this blanket sort of avoidance of the sun and, and belief that that sunlight is harmful to their eyes. Um, I'm curious what you think about the role of artificial light from from screens as well as like indoor fluorescent lighting uh, in, in relationship to things like cataracts and macular degeneration. Kind of the, the concept of malillumination. Yeah, so uh, if you and I were say all day in a in an office in artificial foods, it would be like if we went down the street and we went and ate McDonald's. It's it's so um, it, it's so suppressing your immune system and your natural energy flow. So the idea that you know malillumination, malnutrition, we need to get at least sixty minutes of natural light every day. Notice how you feel when you go outside after working on the computer and you're in the sunlight in San Diego. And you go, ah, you take a deep breath. It's like, that's what your nervous system needs. Mm -hmm. So this idea of artificial light, actually you get more dental problems, more hyperactivity. I mean, the research is solid in terms of the light diet. And, you know, if you want to protect your eyes for part of the day to use a sun lens, well, then get a really good polarized neutral gray lens. You can do that. But I want you to get 30 to 60 minutes of sunlight every day. You can do it before 10 a.m. or after 5 p.m. If you want to wear a hat, you know, that's fine too. But you must get natural light. There's too much fear out there that's pumped into us being afraid of the sun. Hey, we are made of the sun. We are made of photons. Autoimmune. That's what you're basically teaching people to do. So, um, so many benefits from sunlight. And, and then in terms of the screens, the blue light, you know, you probably know all this about how it, it's, it's not good for your eyes and vision. You need to protect yourself and you need to, you know, take care about uh, the blue light from the, the blue light from the, the digital devices. Well, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more because when we get natural light outdoors during the day, we're also getting blue light. But when, when we're getting it from screens are we getting it in a different spectrum or um is is blue light from you know artificial light from man-made you know electronic devices from screens is that different in some profound way from uh from the outdoor natural light the blue light that we would get from that yeah it's very different because when we're outside uh we're actually getting more of the frequencies and actually the blue light actually increases as the sun starts to set. Uh, but on a digital device, uh, basically you're getting this flickering coming at you all the time. It's a very narrow band of blue light and it's going to damage the macula over time. Again, if your phytonutrients aren't there, if you're toxic, if your mitochondria aren't working, uh, or another thing that's happening now is that people that do get cataract surgery, see, our lens, our, our original hardware of lens, has a pigment that blocks the blue light. But when you get a cataract uh, intraocular lens put in, it doesn't have that protection. And the doctor doesn't tell you that. Mm -hmm. So then in a year, you start developing macular degeneration, and you weren't told that you don't have the blue blocker in your natural lens or to even get blue blocking lenses. So all these people now who have had cataract surgery are now getting macular degeneration. Wow. So I think, you know, we need to know what's, what our doctor is putting in our body, you know, plastic lens, the same thing. I don't want plastic in my body, do you? Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are things that, again, you can uh, be proactive. See, what I see about eye doctors in general is that we are reactive. You go into the doctor, here's the drug, here's the steroid, whatever. And my approach is, no, let's be proactive. Let's educate you. Let's take you far from your status quo. And boom, you've got, you've got your vision back at any age, even as you get older. We can't blame it on age. No way. Mm -hmm. So a, f a few more questions on that subject. Um, should people be wearing certain, like, um, they're not like the same blue blockers that people wear uh, at night before bed that like I wear at night before bed, but they, they make certain blue blockers that block a certain band of wavelengths within the blue spectrum 
for people to use while working on their computer and things like that. Are you a fan of those or not? So that's a really great question. And I did a lot of research on blue blocking lenses. And what I came up with is that during the day, you can wear that very light blue blocking lens uh, so you can still get some light into your eyes. And then after six or seven o'clock, we probably have a similar thing. I have a much darker blue blocker lens. So if I'm working on the computer later, then it's blocking out more of the light. But I have a rule that you want to stop working on that digital device at least an hour before you go to sleep. Because you may notice if you're working on that digital device until bed, you're not going to sleep as well. And so there are different gradients that you can get that block out different wavelengths and bandwidths, bandwidths based on what time of day you're using uh, the computer or whatever. So that's been yeah. my approach. And the feedback I've been getting is really good from people. Yeah. Now, one other thing on that, I, I, uh, you mentioned briefly the flicker from screens. So I, I actually have a fancy computer screen that I'm looking at right now, and it's um, one that I bought for a few reasons. One, it's really big, which I like to have a million windows open at once when I'm doing work, so I needed something that was a big screen. Um, but the, the things that are special about this are that it's flicker-free technology, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but they, there's a few companies that make this flicker-free technology. Uh, and it also has low blue light settings on it. So the screen itself will, I don't have, without me having to wear glasses, will eliminate like 70% of the blue light emission from the screen. Um, and it's awesome, I love it. Um, but what's, what's, your, what's your take on that? And, and also, can you talk a bit about the flicker thing? Because uh, I think for, it, for me, it's, it's definitely something that I think hinders people's energy levels without them realizing it is when they're looking at screens that flicker. But um, can you talk about it from the perspective of eye health in particular? Mm -hmm. So basically a lot of people are getting into a situation where they're not using their eyes together. And their eyes actually travel at different speed in terms of processing information. So they've got this built-in flicker going on and then they're trying to interface it with the computer's refresh rate and it creates light sensitivity, headaches, fatigue. It's a real energy drain. Mm. And also, if they're wearing those tiny whole progressive lenses or the wrong prescription, then that makes it even more tenuous in terms of their own flickering versus you know the computer's flickering. And then, of course, if their nutrients are not, uh, you know, they're not absorbing them or they have inflammation or whatever, that's going to create all kinds of problems. I think what you have is really, really good. Uh, the thing that I would add is something called the 20-20-20 rule. You've heard of this. So every 20 minutes, you look out at 20 feet, and you do that 20 seconds. And that little reminder of 20-20-20 really helps sustain people's resiliency in being able to stay on the computer all day. And yeah, be aware of that flicker rate because it, is, it drains you, and then you got the MF issue and all that. But yeah, so... Um, I, I think it's a big issue that people need to be aware of. Definitely. Um, on that subject, one of the other questions I was going to ask you is about myopia and, and just this, this issue, which is related to a lot of the stuff you've, you've talked about so far. Um, but myopia is this growing epidemic from people looking at screens too much. Yes. And so the, the best way to combat it is this sort of 20-20-20 rule. Well, that's one thing to do. Another thing would be to go to your eye doctor and negotiate with him or her. This is really out there. Let's say, hey, doctor, you're giving me a 2020 prescription. Can you give me a 2040 prescription? So something slightly less. And that actually opens your vision more to wear something less. Another thing to do is you could start wearing reverse prescription glasses in your bedroom for like a minute and that actually helps reduce the myopia because now you're wearing a positive lens that puts you into a lot of blur. blur. That freaks people out. Because you know, if you think about what's your belief system on blur? I don't like it. I'm out of control. It, it makes me tense. The idea is surrendering into the blur. It actually allows the eye muscles to relax. When you take them off, you're going to have less myopia. If you do that 30, so I give you the 30 day challenge. Do that for 30 days your prescription is going to drop at least 10%. That's, yeah. That's and maybe, maybe also get outdoors and go walk around and outside yeah. instead of staring at a screen all day. Also, aerobic exercise, get out and hike. You know, I live near 
the national forest. So I'm hiking every day to balance out my computer use. Oh yeah, I mean, you gotta get outside and, and connect with nature. It's so important, it slows you down, it's great for you. Yeah, um, one more light related question. Uh, you, and you mentioned this briefly about blue blockers at night and the role of melatonin. Um, when people, how, how does melatonin relate specifically to the eye health? And I know that um, throughout the, I, I haven't looked at the, the relationship specifically to eye health, but I, I certainly know that melatonin acts as an antioxidant and as a, as a, as a protector of mitochondria throughout the body. So it, it only makes sense that um, if, if you are chronically suppressing melatonin levels when your body should be producing them, that eventually your mitochondria um, throughout your body, and I would imagine also your eyes, become more susceptible to damage. Is that accurate? Yes, and there's actually a photoreceptor in the retina that they just discovered that activates melatonin, mm. which is really interesting. And um, you know, we need to be in the dark as well as the light, of course, because that helps activate. Uh, but there's a really st strong connection between our retina health, melatonin production, mitochondria production, circadian rhythm. I mean, it's all related. Like when I hear you talk about it, it's like, yeah, I'm just talking about it through the eyes. You're talking about it from another perspective. But we're talking the same thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's coming from the same place yeah. in pineal. So yeah, it's obvious. It's yeah. Obvious. Beautiful. So how do we, I kind of want to, we've talked about a lot of, a lot of different things. I'd, I'd love if you could kind of give people a, a sort of recap and an overview of how all these different pieces fit together in sort of a treatment program or, or like a daily regimen um, of how someone might go about either fixing you know existing cataracts or, or macular degeneration or at least maybe stopping the progression um, or just people who are interested in protecting their eye health and and not getting eye diseases okay so so we've so, talked about the, the kind of the physical therapy some of the nutrients um the color therapy and you know various things like that how to kind of paint a picture for me of what all of this looks like all right so what i would say to you know somebody out there listening to this podcast I would say I would break it down into three main points. Number one, uh, do something different than your normal routine with your eyes. It could be take your glasses or contacts off for part of the day in a non-demanding, non-threatening situation. I would build in eye relaxation exercises like palming or sunning or eye massage. These are free exercises on my website, videos that I've created. I would say be aware of your phytonutrients and some key ones would be you know, the glutathione, the lutein zeaxanthin, um, making sure you're eating a lot of plant-based uh, foods and you know, the rainbow diet, if that's all you can remember in terms of plants, you know, fruits and vegetables. Um, and then finally, take a break from the computer. That 20-20-20 rule would be something you want to build into your daily routine. So those would be some simple things. If you go to my Facebook page, I probably have like almost 100 videos that are free. If you've got a certain condition, click on that for two minutes, you're going to get a sound bite on this is what you need to do. A, B, B, B. I want to give a lot of free information to people. And so if they click into my resource, they're going to get a lot of great stuff. And um, then you can start coming into my community and it's going to be very much paralleling what you do. And there it is. You, you just have a lot of support. Beautiful. So you, you also sell uh, certain supplements. I know you sell the MSM eye drops for people with floaters and those are very effective for floaters and, yeah. and you have some other s stuff you sell. Do you, do you also sell any like programs where kind of that, that covers how to do all the eye exercises or wh where should people go to find out more about that? If you go to my website, drsamburn.com and you can actually type in in the magnifier up in the right corner, Macular pucker, that's a big one now, or floaters, or cataracts. I have free kits, like a cataract for a program, a macular degeneration, 90-day eye exercise program, and it's free. You just download it. So, yeah, if you go to my website, it's such incredible things. My team has done such a great job in organizing it. So, yeah, go there. It's free. You get all this information. Start working on reducing your cataracts, your macular degeneration, 
through glaucoma, get rid of your myopia. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can help your eyes. And Beautiful. And, and what, what we'll do on our end, uh, we'll make a link. This podcast is going to be at uh, theenergyblueprint.com forward slash I dash health. So theenergyblueprint.com, I health, but with a little dash or hyphen between I and health. And then we'll put links to all of those different pages. So for, for various conditions, we'll link over to your site uh, and just have, have it all kind of be there as well. So, uh, Dr. Byrne, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure to have this discussion with you. And um, I, I've had so many burning questions on my mind. And uh, I, to be honest, I've really wanted to talk to an optometrist who also has some knowledge of nutrition and lifestyle and the importance of light and doesn't just think, you know, the sun is bad and everybody should avoid the sun, and, but actually has looked into the research on that. Uh, so it's it's absolutely a, a pleasure to do this, and thank you so much for for sharing your your wisdom with my audience. And next time I'm in San Diego, I'm taking you out to Peace Pies. Oh, definitely, would love that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite restaurants. So, thank you so much, and and uh, yeah, take take care, and and hopefully we can uh, do another podcast at some point. Yeah, great. Okay, Ari, be well. All right, take care.